Welcome back to I Am Medical. In the previous episode, we spoke about acute management of congestive heart failure and we ordered an echocardiogram. And guess what? The echocardiogram is finally back. And now, it's time to talk about everything that we need to know about chronic management when it comes to congestive heart failure. So let's begin. Well, our patient is clinically doing well and he's become euvolemic at this point and he's lying flat on his bed. But what is missing in our story is our echocardiogram. And guess what? Our echo is finally back. We take a look at the echocardiogram and we see that the patient's ejection fraction is 45%. And he also looks like he's got some wall motion abnormalities of the left ventricle. There's some hypokinesia going on of the left ventricle. But his valves look fine. It makes this patient have a diagnosis of heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Wait a second, we have to define heart failure with reduced ejection fraction precisely. It all depends on if your ejection fraction is above 50 or below 50. Let's keep 50 as our line. 50 will be considered normal. If the patient has an ejection fraction above 50, but the patient is clinically presenting to you with features that suggest that he has congestive heart failure, and then we get an echocardiogram which shows an ejection fraction above 50%, this is going to be called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, meaning the heart function is preserved, but there's mostly a diastolic problem going on with the patient's heart. But the patient clinically presents like he's got fluid overload and it is because of congestive heart failure. So that is called heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Well, when we go into the realm of below 50, we actually need to talk about below 40 first. Heart failure reduced ejection fraction is an ejection fraction less than 40%. And that is where we know for a fact that most of these drugs are going to have mortality benefit. So 40 to 50 has always been kind of a limbo period. Are there drugs that truly really have mortality benefit or not? We didn't know. There are some drugs now that we know of that do have mortality benefit even in the range of 40 to 50%. Now, what do we call this 40 to 50%? Are you saying mid-range? Well, it used to be called mid-range between 40 to 50, but now we call it mildly reduced. And our patient has an ejection fraction of 45%. So makes him have a diagnosis of mildly reduced ejection fraction congestive heart failure. Okay, now since we have a diagnosis, the patient is clinically doing well, we should focus on chronic management. And chronic management is where we're going to be talking about guideline directed medical therapy, which is so relevant in clinical practice. And the exams absolutely loves this topic. So what is the first step we're going to take? Before we start drugs, when the patient has a diagnosis of an ejection fraction less than 50%, we should determine why this patient even got this problem to begin with. Coronary artery disease is number one. Number two is going to be hypertension. Remember, when you have hypertension, what happens is your heart muscle is trying to pump blood again very strong afterload and as a result initially will undergo hypertrophy resulting in more of a diastolic heart failure but after a long time the heart cannot go on like that. It gets stretched and stretched and stretched because it's working so hard. It will eventually end up with a dilated cardiomyopathy, also known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The third most important cause is going to be valvular heart disease. Anytime the patient's got a left-sided valvular pathology, such as aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation or a mitral regurgitation, when you have a valvular pathology, it can eventually lead to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because there's so much volume overload within those ventricles that's going to stretch and stretch and stretch and eventually cause a dilated cardiomyopathy also called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And number four, which probably the exams love to test on for the longest time is alcohol. Why does alcohol cause dilated cardiomyopathy? Because most people who drink alcohol or alcoholics by definition do not eat well. And most of the time what happens is they end up with something known as thiamine deficiency. And thiamine is required for most of your dehydrogenase enzymes that plays a big role in TCA cycle. So if you don't have thiamine, what would happen is most of the enzymes such as pyruvate dehydrogenase or alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, which is part of your TCA cycle, will not be able to work because they require time as a cofactor. And as a result, what would happen? You would not produce any energy. And if you don't produce energy, 
the most energy dependent organs in the body would get damaged right and what is the most energy dependent organs in the body are you saying brain and heart absolutely so what would you end up with in your brain is Wernicke Korsakoff because of the iron deficiency and in your heart you would end up with something known as a wet beriberi and dry beriberi is when you have neuropathy again could happen because of the iron deficiency so that's how alcohol does it so alcohol is one of them and then you also have cocaine now cocaine when people obviously take cocaine it has direct injury to your cardiac myocytes and can cause dilated cardiac myopathy next we have coxsackie virus which also causes direct damage to cardiac myocytes and causes a dilated cardiac myopathy then we got Chagas disease which is caused by trypanosoma cruzi it basically dilates everything when you got Chagas disease right you get a dilated esophagus you get a dilated heart and that's what Chagas disease is going to be doing again how does it do it it causes direct damage to your cardiac myocytes next we got doxyrubicin doxyrubicin being a chemotherapeutic drug it can cause cardiomyopathy because of direct injury to the cardiac myocytes next is going to be hemochromatosis remember when you have iron overload in your body when you have too much iron getting deposited everywhere in including your heart it can cause problems to your heart when you think of hemochromatosis it can cause two pathologies it can cause an infiltrative disease of the heart and cause a restrictive cardiomyopathy but it can also cause a dilated cardiomyopathy lastly you got peripartum cardiomyopathy typically happens as the word obviously says is females after they deliver babies they can actually have damage to their heart so these are your causes for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so whenever you have a patient with an ejection fraction less than 50% you always need to find the etiology so when you think about any patient who comes to your hospital or the clinic or in your exams the number one thing that we have to do in this patients is going to be some form of ischemic workup to see if the patient's got coronary artery disease how do you decide what kind of ischemic workup you're going to do well it's going to be dependent on your scoring system to determine what kind of ischemic workup you do whether you're going to do a stress test or a cardiac cath bottom line is you will do an ischemic workup so once you've identified the etiology for this patient's congestive heart failure the next big question is what are we going to start this patient on well we're going to start this patient on guideline directed medical therapy guideline directed medical therapy what do you mean well what i'm trying to talk about is do we know the pathophysiology as to why these problems are happening in a patient with heart failure well yes we do so let's quickly recap why this is even happening imagine somebody's heart is not pumping like it should you're going to have a decreased cardiac output this is going to activate two important things number 1 it's going to activate your sympathetic pathway because you're hypotensive and your beta receptors are not getting stretched your brain stem is going to see this as well you got a low blood pressure i have to stimulate my sympathetic system so you stimulate sympathetic system and that's going to cause stimulation of beta 1 receptors in your heart and alpha 1 stimulation in your blood vessel which is going to lead to tachycardia number 1 as well as inotropy of your heart and it's going to increase your afterload both of which are going to be problems and targets of our drug therapy next you're going to be activating a ras system why because you have a decreased cardiac output and if you activate your ras system you convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 is obviously going to cause system systemic vasoconstriction it is going to stimulate your sympathetic stimulation it is going to stimulate release of aldosterone from your adrenal gland and it's also going to stimulate release of adh when you think about it what is it doing it is causing overall increased reabsorption of sodium and water why are your aldosterone as well as why adh that is overall going to increase the volume that's going to be present in your patient's body but apart from that it's also going to cause increased stimulation of your sympathetic and direct stimulation of your blood vessels to increase your afterload so you see what the problem is because of sympathetic activation and ras activation what do we have increased preload increased beta 1 stimulation of your heart and increased afterload and activation of aldosterone so our drug therapy is going to go after targeting all of these things because when you have all of these activation what would it do it would actually cause your heart to work harder and harder and eventually cause hypertrophy of your cardiac muscle and when your cardiac muscle hypertrophies you will run out of blood supply for those cardiac myocytes and eventually lead to apoptosis and thinning out of certain sections of your heart and certain sections around it is still going to have hypertrophy which is eventually going to pull and pull and pull and lead to what we call as a dilated cardiomyopathy and this is known as cardiac remodeling so all of these things happen to help the patient acutely but on the long run it becomes a vicious cycle and leads to cardiac remodeling so 
what is guideline directed medical therapy going to do? We're going to target every single one of these steps and prevent this problem from happening. It is that easy. So let's go to the next step. Before we start guideline directed medical therapy, I want to give you guys a couple of rules we are going to follow. Number one, you will start an individual drug. You will increase the dose, but you don't max out the dose. You will add the next drug before you max out the first drug's dose. And this is known as sequential addition of these drugs. And combination therapy actually is much better than individual drugs themselves. Ground rules have been set. Let's move on to individual drugs. What is the first drug we're going to add as guideline directed medical therapy? Well, are you saying let's go ahead and just block off your RAS system? You're absolutely right on the money. The first step would be to start a RAS inhibitor, which is renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So basically, we're going to go ahead and block this system. So the drugs we've always had have been ACE inhibitors. You have angiotensin receptor blockers and now a newer drug group that is called angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibitor. These are your three big drug groups that's going to be present when it comes to RAS blockade. Now ACE inhibitors are drugs like lisinopril and enalapril. Whereas angiotensin receptor blockers are drugs with and with artin. Drugs such as losartan, erbisartan, candisartan. Now, the new drug group, which is known as angiotensin receptor naprolysin inhibitor, is known as sacubitril walsartan. Now, walsartan essentially is an angiotensin receptor blocker, whereas the sacubitril component, it actually blocks an enzyme known as neprolysin. And neprolysin's job is to break down BNP, which is brain natriuretic peptide. BNP, what does it do in your body? It basically causes natriuresis basically makes you pee and get rid of volume. So the fact that naprolysin inhibition increases your BNP, it is basically going to cause natriuresis and ends up with losing volume from your body, which is going to be beneficial for your patient. Which is better? Is an ACE or better than Arnie or is Arnie better than ACE and ARBs? Arnie is absolutely better than your ACE or your ARBs based on your Pioneer and Paradigm heart failure trials, which has shown that is actually better than both of these drugs. So when you want to start the drug, you start the drug at a lower dose. And how often would you increase the dose of these drugs? Are you saying every day? Answer is no. You will double the dose of the drug every one to two weeks. Now it is important to note that ACE, ARBs and ORNI can cause renal dysfunction, right? Because you're blocking your RAS system. So before you start the patients on a drug, make sure you get a basic metabolic panel to see what the patient's creatinine is and what the patient's potassium is. Because these drugs can actually cause AKI, and hyperkalemia. Once you've reached the maximal tolerated dose of these drugs, you can repeat your labs every three to six months to make sure the patient's renal function is staying intact. But in the initial period, you want to repeat your potassium as well as BMP every one to two weeks to make sure there is no renal dysfunction. Given that RNA is a newer drug, it is more expensive and sometimes insurance might not pay for it. So you want to make sure the patient can absolutely afford these drugs before you actually start them on it. And RNA can actually cause significant hypotension. So you want to make sure the patient's systolic blood pressure is greater than 100 before you actually start the drug. Given that RNA is a newer group of drugs, what about if somebody's already been on an ACE inhibitor or an ARP for a long time before? Do you switch them from an ACE and ARP to an RNA now since it's better? Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. If somebody's on an ACE or ARP, you will switch them to an RNA. Important caveat here, what is the most important and common side effect of an ACE inhibitor? You're talking about cough. What is the dreaded complication you worry about when somebody's on an ACE inhibitor? Are you worried about angioedema? Absolutely. So if somebody's got angioedema on an ACE inhibitor, you can switch to an ARB. But can ARBs cause angioedema? It can cause angioedema. And therefore, you can switch to an ARB if somebody's angioedema on ACE, but if you're on an ARP, it can also happen and the patient should know about it. If somebody's on an ACE inhibitor and you wanted to switch to an ARNI, there needs to be a washout period of at least 36 hours. The reason for this is if you're going from an ACE inhibitor to an ARNI immediately, there's a very high risk of angioedema actually happening with combined therapy because ACE inhibitor still is going to be in your blood system when you start the patient on ARNI. Okay, so if you're going from an ACE to ARNI, you need a washout period. What if you go from an ARB to Arnie. Do you need a washout period? No, you don't because angiotensin receptor blockers does not have such a high incidence of angioedema and therefore going from an ARB to Arnie does not require a washout period. Okay, so why does ACE inhibition or Arnie cause angioedema? Well, it's all due to biochemistry. Angiotensin converting enzyme, apart from doing its action in the RAS pathway, it also has a very important function in breaking down bradykinin in your lungs. Bradykinin in your lungs are broken down by the enzyme angiotensin 
angiotensin converting enzyme now angiotensin converting enzymes as you guys already know is produced in the endothelial cells of the lungs so it does have an important function in the lung itself it breaks down bradykinin so you come in and start the patient on an ACE inhibitor or an ARNI and you block off the angiotensin converting enzyme you raise bradykinin levels and the bradykinin elevation is what's going to cause a significant vasodilation within your lungs and lead to angioedema another important point to make is about the nephrolysin inhibition by nephrolysin inhibition you are going to elevate your bnp levels and bnp is what is going to result in natriuresis and get rid of fluid from your body if your bnp is not going to be broken could bnp be falsely elevated in this patient absolutely your bnp will be elevated in this so you cannot gauge patient's volume status using bnp like you normally do in this patient so what you would use instead is an n-terminal pro bnp which is not broken down by nephrolysin the next drug group we are going to be starting this patients on are going to be beta blockers can you start any beta blocker in this patient the answer is no beta blockers do not have a class effect what i mean by that is not all beta blockers have mortal benefit there are only three beta blockers in this context that truly have mortal benefit it is metaprolol succinate which is the long acting beta blocker not metaprolol tartate so it's metaprolol succinate you have carvedilol and bisoprolol carvedilol unlike metaprolol succinate and bisoprolol actually has vasodilating properties because it is a combined blocker of both beta and alpha receptors and therefore can cause this additional vasodilation how do we start the drug you start at a low dose and how often do you increase the dose are you saying every day no you increase the dose every one to two weeks okay so you increase the dose every one to two weeks and what are you targeting are you saying a heart rate of 55 to 60 absolutely because remember we said that the patient's having tachycardia and that's a problem because of your sympathetic stimulation so we are using the beta blocker to block that beta 1 receptors and therefore your target heart rate has to be 55 to 60 so what is the optimal dose for each of these drugs metaprolol is actually 200 milligrams per day whereas carbidilol was 25 milligrams orally bid if your patient is greater than 85 kilograms your carbidilol's optimal dose was 50 milligrams bid whereas bisoprolol's optimal dose was 10 milligrams oral daily can everybody get to such high doses probably not because when you go up on a beta blocker there could be side effects from the drug you could have hypotension we also need to remember that beta blockers obviously come with side effects so you cannot use it in somebody who's got significant vasospastic disease such as vasospastic asthma or vasospastic angina such as prince metal angina or anybody with any form of heart block since there are three beta blockers that have mortal benefit comparatively is one better than the other well the straightforward answer at this point is no they are all equally effective there has been meta-analysis of trials comparing vasodilating beta blockers to non-vasodilating beta blockers so vasodilating beta blockers being carbidilol to metaprolol succinate and bisoprolol which are non-vasodilating there has been some evidence that the vasodilating actually was better because the combined effect of it actually dropping afterload but the data is not sufficient at this point of time for us to say that carbidilol is actually better than bisoprolol or metaprolol succinate the next drug group that is going to have mortal benefit in this patient is going to be mra which is mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist so we are going after aldosterone because aldosterone was reabsorbing sodium in water and causing a lot of problems we only have two drugs in this group one of which is spironolactone and the other is eplirinone that spironolactone also has anti-androgenic effects and therefore can cause gynecomastia breast pain menstrual irregularities and decreased libido and therefore if you had to pick a drug from this group you would prefer to pick eplerinone as your first choice because eplerinone does not have the anti-androgenic side effects now mras can cause renal dysfunction so before you start this patient on these drugs you want to make sure the patient renal function is good hyperkalemia is another important side effect you want to keep in your mind because aldosterone causes reabsorption of sodium and water and pushes out H plus and potassium. Normally, it would cause metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia. So if you block aldosterone, you would expect the opposite, such as hyperkalemia. And hyperkalemia can kill somebody, so you want to track the patient's potassium on follow-up. The next drug group which has mortal benefit are the SGLT2 inhibitors, such as dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and sotagliflozin. Now, 
Wait a second, are you saying what are you talking about? This is all diabetic drugs. SGLT2 inhibitors are used in diabetes. Well, do you know that they actually do have mortal benefit in the realm of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction right now? Even if you did not have diabetes, absolutely, this is a new finding that we found in lots of trials. And SGLT2 inhibitors actually have mortal benefit even if you did not have diabetes just for patients with congestive heart failure. Now, the trial actually presented this data is DAPA heart failure study for dapagliflozin, emperor trial for empagliflozin, and the chief trial for canagliflozin. Bottom line is SGLT2s have absolute benefit in these patients when you have a reduced ejection fraction. But every drug comes with a side effect. Now SGLT2 inhibitors does have an interesting side effect profile. One of the most important things you want to be mindful about is euglycemic DKA. How does SGLT2 inhibitors work? It basically blocks glute transporters in your kidney to prevent it from reabsorbing glucose. So if you're not going to reabsorb glucose, you will pee out a lot of glucose in the urine. And when you're peeing out a lot of glucose in the urine, remember, what does glucose love to hold on to? Water. So as a result, it would cause a lot of diuresis and get volume out of the body. It could lead to volume depletion and kind of precipitate a diabetic ketoacidosis, but the patient will be euglycemic because the drug makes you pee out a lot of glucose. Why does it cause diabetic ketoacidosis per se? It is not well understood at this time because you peeing out glucose alone should not be enough to cause ketosis. Whenever a patient is peeing out a lot of glucose in their urine, what likes glucose is bacteria and therefore you can cause urinary tract infections because there's so much glucose in your urine. Number three is amputations. It actually leads to patients having increased peripheral arterial disease and cause amputations. If you want to start patients on SGLT2, make sure the patient is not a type 1 diabetic because type 1 diabetics are more prone for diabetic ketoacidosis and therefore you should not start it on them. Hold SGLT2 inhibitors in patients who are going to be prone for going into diabetic ketoacidosis such as a state of fasting for some other reason in the hospital or the patient is going to undergo surgery, then you want to hold this drug because it can precipitate a diabetic ketoacidosis. Now SGLT2 inhibitors as the drug class all drugs do have mortal de benefit even the drugs i have not spoken about should probably have mortal de benefit it does have a class effect why does sglt2 inhibitors have mortal de benefit again it is not understood it is not because it makes you pee out all the glucose in the urine it does cause glucose urea and diuresis but that is not the reason for the mortal de benefit the next drug group to be sequentially added is going to be hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate has mortal de benefit only in african american population once they are already on an ace arbo arni with a beta blocker and an MRA. Why does hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate have benefit? Because isosorbide dinitrate decreases preload and hydralazine decreases afterload, therefore would decrease the blood volume that's coming to your heart by decreasing preload and your heart works easier against a lower afterload and therefore the remodeling will be less. So these are drug groups that truly have mortal benefit when you have an ejection fraction less than 50%. Now, Important caveat, like I said from before, most of these drugs truly have mortal de benefit only when your ejection fraction is less than 40%. So in the limbo land of 40 to 50%, what we call as mildly reduced, the only drugs that have mortal de benefit in that region between 40 to 50 is going to be your RAS blockers such as ACE, ARBs, ARNI, your beta blockers and your SGLT2s. Your hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate do not have mortal de benefit when your ejection fraction is above 40%. It is solely in patients with an ejection fraction less than 40%. Well, those are the primary drugs that you're going to be adding on your patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So you see, you're not going to start all these drugs at once in the hospital. When the echocardiogram is back in the hospital, what we would do is we would start the patient on a RAS blocker first, along with a beta blocker and send this patient out. And once we see this patient in the clinic in one to two weeks, you will sequentially add every single drug and slowly work your way up on every single drug's dosing, sure that the patient is not having side effects from these drugs and they're tolerating it well. These drug groups that I've spoken about, absolutely high yield for any exam you take or in your clinical practice. Well, are there any other drugs that we can be adding to our patient which does not have mortal de benefit? Sure there are. Well, number one is a drug called Ivabradin. Now, Ivabradin is a sodium funny current blocker. Sodium funny channels are present in your nodal fibers in your heart and if you block them, what it would do is cause bradycardia and therefore would be beneficial in your patients. Ivabradin is a drug that you will use as an add-on to your beta blocker to get to your target heart rate 
Because remember, beta blockers can cause hypertension, but ivabradin works only in your nodal fibers and therefore will have zero impact on inotropy and therefore it would not mess around with your contraction and therefore would have zero impact on your blood pressure. So ivabradin is a great drug for you to start on your patients already on beta blockers if your target heart rate is not reached. If your target heart rate is not 55 to 60, you can add ivabradin. The data for ivabradin comes from the SHIFT trial. But does the drug have mortality benefit? Absolutely not. But it did decrease hospitalization and therefore is beneficial. Obviously, every drug has a side effect. So what is the important side effects to remember with ivabradin? Obviously, it causes bradycardia, so you want to make sure you're not becoming too bradycardic. Number two is a very unique visual side effect. You will have a transient increase in brightness in your visual fields and this is supposed to be because the drug contains phosphines and lastly it can increase your risk of atrial fibrillation the next drug which can be beneficial but does not have mortality benefit is going to be digox it causes increased contraction of the heart which is going to lead to an increased cardiac output thereby raising your blood pressure which would bring in a reflex bradycardia and therefore can cause increased inotropy and bradycardia and therefore is useful in patients with congestive heart failure but it does not have mortal benefit benefit. So given that digoxin has both inotropy and bradycardia happening at the same time, so it would be a great drug to add in a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction plus atrial fibrillation to control the rate. When starting digoxin, you always want to know that digoxin has a very narrow therapeutic window and therefore can cause digoxin toxicity very easily. The next drug group that we can use in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is going to be a drug known as Fericiguat. It's an oral soluble guanyl cyclase stimulator, meaning it works through nitric oxide and cyclic GMP and causes vasodilation and thereby decreases afterload and decreases the resistance that your heart has to work against. Now, Fericiguat will be started at a starting dose of 2.5 milligrams PO daily with food and you slowly work your way up on the dose to get to the maximal tolerated dose. The data for Vericiguat comes from the Victoria trial and the Victoria trial basically showed that it did not have mortality benefit but it did show a non-significant reduction in both death and hospital admissions. And Vericiguat can be used as an add-on drug only in patients who've been admitted in the last six months to the hospital for IV diuresis. Vericiguat is contraindicated in patients taking a long-acting nitrate or a phosphodiesterase inhibitor such as sildenafil because it can cause hypertension when taken together. Now this completes all the drugs that you need to know about in a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Well, is there anything else that we can do in these patients that probably is going to have mortal benefit? Are you thinking of a device therapy? There we go. I know what you're thinking about. So device therapy absolutely is going to have mortal benefit. So question is, when is a device therapy indicated? Number one. So say you start the patient on guideline directed medical therapy. You want to repeat this patient's echocardiogram to see if the patient's heart function is actually improving. So question is, after how long should you be repeating the echocardiogram? Well, if a patient had myocardial infarction and right now we find out that the patient's ejection fraction is low, you want to repeat the echocardiogram in 40 days. So post MI, you want to repeat the echocardiogram 40 days later to see if the ejection fraction has improved. Whereas the patient did not have a myocardial infarction like our patient here, you would repeat the echocardiogram traditionally in three months. You would repeat the echocardiogram in three months and see what the ejection fraction is. If your ejection fraction is improved, great. You don't need a device therapy. But if your ejection fraction 40 days later or after three months is less than 35%, then the patient will require a device therapy. So what device therapy am I talking about? Well, the bottom line is this. When you have a low ejection fraction, you are prone for cardiac arrhythmias such as VTAC and ventricular fibrillation, and both of which can actually make your heart stop and kill you. So you place the device to shock you out of that rhythm when it does happen. So anybody EF less than 35% at this point will always get an AICD. The question is, should they also get something known as a cardiac resynchronization therapy which is a biventricular pacemaker in addition to your AICD. The indication for cardiac resynchronization therapy basically a biventricular pacemaker is on a patient who's already on maximal tolerated guideline rated medical therapy. You repeat the echocardiogram, the EF less than 35%, NYHA class 2 to 4 plus. What you're looking for is two things, a left bundle branch block and a QRS duration. If you have a left bundle branch block plus a QRS duration greater than 150 milliseconds, those are the patients who are going to have the most benefit. Number two, if you had a QRS complex duration greater than 150, but no left bundle branch block, that is the second group of patients that's going to have mortality benefit. Now, there are two more indications which have lesser benefit, and that is a left bundle branch block plus a QRS duration between 120 to 149 has benefit, but lesser than your initial indication, 
Next is a patient that has no bundle branch block but your QRS duration is greater than 150. Most patients who are going to get a cardiac resynchronization therapy would almost always have an indication for an AICD so you would give them both an AICD plus a biventricular pacemaker. So typically we're going to place these devices in these patients after a trial period of guideline directed medical therapy because most of these guideline directed medical therapy would improve your patient's ejection fraction. There's a very high risk of patient having sudden arrhythmias and death and that's the reason we put these devices. Well, if that's the case, should we not be putting this patient on these devices straight off the bat once you diagnose with a low ejection fraction? You would think so, right? Because it would make sense. So we do have an external defibrillator, which we call as a life vest, which patients can wear across their chest and can shock your patients out of VTAC or VFib in the interim until they get a permanent device. But there was a trial which is known as the VEST trial, which showed that wearing a temporary cardiac defibrillator did not have benefit in reducing arrhythmic death within 84 days of MI in this large randomized trial. And it's not part of guideline to put everybody on a life vest until you get a permanent defibrillator. It is not indicated at this time based on this trial. So this completes all the drugs as well as the device therapy that you're going to be placing in your patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And you know this, you know everything that you need to know in managing your patients efficiently. Well, what are some of the drugs that clearly do not have benefit in this instance? Well, first drug to talk about will be aspirin. Does aspirin have a role in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? The answer is no. You don't need to put patients on aspirin unless they have a concurrent indication such as CAD. Next, what about statins? Statins do not have any role in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction unless they have a concurrent indication such as a high ASCVD or coronary artery disease. Lastly is polyunsaturated fatty acids such as icapentoic acid and doxahexanoic acid. We do have some data from the GC heart failure trial which shows there was some small but non-statistically significant benefit and therefore you can use fish oil in these patients but again it should not prevent patients from actually taking their primary therapies that actually benefit them with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now this concludes everything that you need to know in managing your patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction from drugs to device therapy. If you know this, you know everything, both in the clinical practice and your exams. Thank you for watching. If you like our content, please like this video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so you get notified when a video is released every week. Have fun studying. We'll see you on the next one.